Welcome to the Insomnia Project, the holiday episodes. Of course, this is a time of year that we are grateful to have you listening to our podcast. And feel free to share the cheer and tell your friends and family about our podcast. It could help them with sleep or just keep them company during the holidays. Today, I have a special guest who's been on the podcast before. This is Trevor Martin. Welcome back to the podcast, Trevor. Thanks, Marco. It's great to be back. Trevor, I have some episodes coming up that are Christmas on the farm. I have a couple of episodes. I have one episode, Christmas in the City. And because I know you celebrated some of your time celebrating Christmas in the country, I thought we'd start by talking about Christmas in the country and what it means to you. Oh, I'd love to talk about it. This time of year after the first snowfall, uh, which we had uh, recently, uh, it uh, it always just reminds me of uh, Christmas at my grandparents' house, which is uh, kind of just outside of Kitchener Waterloo, which is a, a bit of a Mennonite community. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, horse and buggies, but also just uh, that kind of uh, type of culture around there. And it, it always reminds me of Christmas. Now, is there any vivid memory or something that stands out for you, Trevor, that makes Christmas in the country distinct from Christmas that you've celebrated here in the city or in the burbs with your wife or elsewhere? I think the main thing is just uh, having the access to big open spaces and like big hills and things like that to go tobogganing down. And then also uh, having like a big backyard. My grandparents had like three quarters of an acre. Uh, and so we wouldn't build like a giant, uh, snow man or snow bunny usually, uh, or uh, a big snow fort. Um, and, uh, I have a brother and a sister and I have, uh, three cousins actually who live kind of in that area. And we would all get together at that time of year and they all have kids and we would go and, you know, do things like have a snowball fight or, um, I remember one neighbor across the street from my grandparents had a huge hill and uh, in his backyard and he had no problem with us coming over and, and tobogganing down it. And it was actually a, a little treacherous. It was quite a, <laughs> quite a steep hill with like uh, lined with trees and uh, a good, uh, a good challenge for those of us with the GT snow racers, which is oh. uh yeah, a type you know, of sled, it, right? It is a type of sled with a like a steering wheel. Uh, so it's got three skis on it, and the uh, lead ski uh, is attached to a steering wheel, and you're able to kind of maneuver around. And uh, it was always fun to to give those a whirl and uh, and uh, to you know challenge your slalom abilities. Now, did I hear you hear you right? You said a snow bunny. You would make a snow bunny. Yes, we uh, we would. Uh, always make a, a snow, like a giant snow person. Okay. And uh, quite often we would, you know, try to make it depending on the, you know, when you, when you make a snowball, it's not always perfectly round. And sometimes it can, it'll have like a bit of a beak to it or a little, uh, sure. it, it's, it'll be more o- oval than uh, circular. And so, I don't know, we just kind of went with it. And uh, because the, the sort of the snout, would uh, appear uh, in the snow. Uh, we would just stick a couple ears on there, and and then it's great for getting little twigs for for whiskers or little kind of pine needles. Uh, and uh, you know, my grandparents always had like a carrot or something in their in their fridge, uh, so it was easy. And we had uh, one year we had what was the name? Uh, my my uh, niece named uh, our our bunny. I think it was Shelly. Shelly, the seven foot snow bunny, the, the snow bunny was bigger than me, like a, by a foot. And, uh, it was just huge, but that's one of the advantages of the country is that there's so much snow and so much space to roll the big snowball that you can make like a seven foot snow bunny. Um, and, and it was just, it was just fun. So speaking from an engineering perspective, how does one get the head of a bunny on a seven foot body? That's an excellent question, actually. Uh, Well, the, the main thing is have at least two people who are over six feet tall. And luckily (laughs) uh, my brother and I and my cousin uh, are all over six feet tall. 
and uh, able to like hoist something like that, uh, <laughs> you know, at least um, probably about five or six feet up in the air uh, and uh, landed on top of these other giant snowballs. Um, yeah. So mainly it's, it's getting two people together uh, who uh, are, are willing and able to do that kind of thing at that height. So- so it's important to tell our listeners who might not be so familiar with snow that there's a certain type or quality of snow that allows you to make snow people, or in this case, snow bunnies or snow forts. Can you tell us about the perfect snow for creating these these items? It's funny because just the other day we had exactly the perfect snow. It was uh, it was the first big snow dump of the year, and the snow. It's like perfect packing snow, uh, which is good for making snowballs and snow forts and things like that, has a little bit of moisture to it and almost a crunch to it. Like when you yes. grab it and you pack it or when you step on it. Um, now, sometimes that kind of snow, if it rains a little bit, can get a crust on it. So you've got sure. a little bit of an ice, uh, an ice, you know, skin Base to or like- get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you and and that can get a little crunchy and it doesn't make for the best snow, but this the snow we just had uh it it's perfect. It's not too wet. Uh it's it, it really uh it really adhe- adheres to each other. Uh, it holds itself. its shape when you press it together, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um and I remember the snow that we just had, it was yeah, it was like light. It was still light. So not so heavy with right. water, but uh, I, I and I'm not sure of the scientific uh, quality that it needs to have, but just enough of this kind of I don't know. It's almost like how do you describe it? It's almost like uh, you know when you have sand when you're at the at the beach and you're making like a sand castle, you can get the sand just wet enough. So that it'll stick together, but right. not so wet that it's going to be like sloppy and and not able to hold together, and not so dry that it doesn't, you know, doesn't stay together. Um, you know, it's kind of that perfect uh, winter miracle, I guess you could say. So we, I know it as packing snow as well. We yeah. we have different qualities of snow, and and the one you make snow people out of, or snow forts, or even snowballs out of, we call packing snow. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we call it too. Uh, mm-hmm. Packing snow, or, or like, it's a, I, I guess, crunch snow is another way. Because like, when you go on a hike and you step in it, it makes that satisfying crunch sound underneath yeah. your your boots, and it, that that's definitely Christmas to me, uh, especially in the country. So let me ask you this: since you, it seems like you're outdoors more when you're celebrating the holidays in the country. Are you lighting? holiday fires or yule logs outside or is that strictly something you do in the fireplace in the country you know uh, my my grandparents lived in a bit of a subdivision so uh, there weren't a lot of houses but it wasn't really uh, the type i mean we would do fires in the fall but mostly it was to burn things like leaves or sure or or wood but uh in the winter not not many people to be honest there was so much snow it would have been hard to to do that kind of thing right um, because you'd have like literally a foot of snow um but we would have my my grandparents have or had a uh a, a wood fire oven like a uh an old kind of wood oven uh back when i was a kid it was it was wood uh and uh it was it was always one of those things where it was so cool and it was so fun to watch the fire, but it was really hot. So you had to sort of, you know, as a kid, you were warned <laughs> so many times not to go near it, not to touch it. Uh, sure. But it was so it was so much fun to watch the fire and help build the fire if you you were allowed to. And what a what a great thing to come back to once you've been outside playing in the snow, a nice warm totally. fire. Uh, yes. Trevor, mm-hmm. now your grandparents lived in a subdivision, but it was really out in the country. Um, Winterborn, it was called, right? Was it Winterborn? Yeah, Winterburn. Yeah, that's the Winterburn. Name of it. What an appropriate name for today's episode, too. Would you ever have to shovel the snow off the roof? 
You know, actually, as I got older uh, and my grandfather got older, yeah, he would always want me to shovel the snow off the route. And I tell you, Marco, my grandfather had the oldest ladder in the world, like the first ladder, like the prototype ladder. It was so old that the rungs were bowed, like they were bent down, like almost like a bow. Um this is a wood As, ladder you're talking about. This is a, right? a, a yeah, it's a wood ladder, but it was big enough and long enough. It is an extension ladder to to extend all the way to a second story roof, right? Um, and even farther than that. But it was like so rickety, and it was like there was some metal. You know how an extension ladder? It's like basically two ladders that are attached by kind yes. of like a binding, and you yeah you, you click it all the way up. And this one. It was like so rusty, like the, <laughs> the bindings were so rusty that it was like, I'm really, you know, taking my life in my hands by going oh my up goodness. this, this thing. And, and so, you know, they, my grandmother would say, you know, can you go up there? Because I don't want your, your grandfather to go. And if you don't go, he's going to go. Wow. So I would go, and I'm not a small person by right. any means, like. Uh, you know, I'm six feet tall. I'm well over 200 pounds. So going up there was like, you know, shaky. Uh, and then I would get up there and I would, you know, take like a, a broom or whatever. Again, like the oldest broom in the world. It's made sure. out of straw. And I would like sweep the snow off because, you know, you don't want to have that much snow on the, on the roof. Maybe it'll, it can get heavy. It could get, sure. you know, and it can cause damage and, and then it can melt and it can, you know, it can turn into water and now you have a drainage problem. So, uh, there was a lot of that and a lot of climbing to get the, the leaves out of the eaves trough, right. uh, which was not only dangerous, but gross. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Trevor, that's one of the things where you can tell someone had holidays in the country or winter in the country. Because that's where you hear the shoveling the snow off the roof stories. Yeah. You don't hear that with people who live in the burbs or the city. No. At all I have, or yeah. as much. I pay handsome condo fees for someone else to do that for me. <laughs> My goodness. All yeah. right, Trevor. So I think it's key since we, we've talked about Christmas in the country. You may remember Trevor from the baking episodes I've had so many people reach out with regards to those episodes. So since I have you here, can we talk holiday baking? Please, let's talk holiday baking. So Trevor, tell me, baking for the holidays, what does that mean to you? Well, at our house, uh, with my grandmother specifically, uh, that meant a couple of things. Uh, it meant she would make a fruitcake, which uh, was very very heavy on the schnapps like a whole bottle of schnapps in this fruitcake uh it was like a prized gift from my grandmother uh she would this um, is a proper german fruitcake trevor it sounds like dense dense and with lots of fruit and like and a brick like i just you would get it in like a aluminum foil brick it was like you were being handed a brick of gold and my dad would get it. He, my dad lives in California now. And my grandmother would mail him fruitcake somehow. I don't, I don't know how the fruitcake got to California via the mail, but, and how expensive it would be. Cause it was like a really heavy cake. Sure. And my, my dad would get it and he would like open it up. He would give some to my mom. And then he would hide it and he would hide it away and he would like kind of eat it on his own and wow. like occasionally. And my mom would be like, he only gives it to me like once a week or something like that. And I know he's taking like little bits of it or whatever. Um, it was Trevor, really that's good. the it, type of fruitcake that one holds dear. It takes a certain type of person to appreciate that kind of fruitcake. And I'm that type of per person. I, I really hate it when people disparage fruitcakes because I feel like they don't understand the complexity, the joy, and what an old baking this is when you put fruit and alcohol together to to sort of preserve the fruit in this type yeah. of baking, and it can last so that it can travel. Like, this is a type of baking 
that were sorely not seen as much anymore. So for me, when you describe this, it sounds like such a treat and delight. And Marco, it stayed so moist for so long. Like you could have it for like a month and it would be as moist as it was when you, the day you got it. Um, and I understand how some people don't like fruitcake because I've had other fruitcakes, especially like commercially baked fruitcakes. Right. And they're so dry. And it's just kind of like, yeah, there's like cherries in it and stuff like that. But when the way my, my I, f- frankly, it was because you put like a literal bottle of schnapps in to like, you know, every loaf. It was just like, really like you were going to get soused if you. If you this, is, this. this is not a bad thing. I want to say kudos to Marie and yes. her fruitcake. And, yes. you know, I just think it's a joy. Uh, do you happen to have that recipe, Trevor? I have it somewhere. Uh, I have yet to actually make this fruitcake uh, mm. because my grandmother, uh, she doesn't bake anymore. She's, she's, they sold their, their house after my grandfather passed and uh, now she's, you know, uh, she's living in a retirement community and, sure. and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think the, in fact, I think the other day we found it to be honest, Marco, I think that that recipe comes from a very popular, uh, Mennonite cookbook and I'm going to, I'm going to plug it here. It's yes, by please Ed, do so by a woman named Edna Stabler and the name of the cookbook is food that really schmecks. Oh my goodness. Schmeck spelt S C H M E C K S, I think. And it's an amazing cookbook. And it's all full of very local to Waterloo region Mennonite and German cooking. And there are so many recipes in that book that are so amazing. There's, uh, it's holiday cooking in the country. Yeah. With a focus on a specific part of Canada and a specific part of the country. Very specific. Yeah. It's so great. And, uh, so, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm definitely going to try, I, I think my, my wife, a, a, a friend of the show, Dale Boyer, uh, recently, um, did something with cherries. I think it uh, remind me, Marco, she, 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 uh, she pickled cherries in alcohol. That's from right. Your summer with cherries rum. with rum. And it was yeah. fantastic, Trevor. The best cherries I've had. Perfect for just putting on ice cream if you like your ice cream a little bit boozy, but also yeah. in our cocktails. And I'll be honest with you, I was just eating them like like cherries. They were that great. Amazing. I think, you know what? I think if we decided to make fruitcake, we could use those cherries, definitely. Um, as well as like maraschino cherries. There's different sure. types. I was of with her recently in. when she bought maraschino cherries, just so you know, oh, you right. have them in your home right now. Trevor... <laughs> Uh, listen, if you make this fruitcake, I will I will stand in line to have some, and I will make sure that anyone who approaches your fruitcake appreciates the fruitcake the way we do. Amazing. Any other recipes from Marie that you want to share or your personal uh, holiday baking? To be honest, Marco, the when I think of holiday baking, we actually bought a lot of our baking from okay. a store in a town called Conestoga. Oh, okay. And if you... If you went to the town, there would be a sign, and the sign says Conestogo. Okay. But everybody calls it Conestoga. And in that town, it's like literally you will drive through it in like 30 seconds. It's so small. By buggy or by car? By buggy, probably a good 20 minutes. But okay. by car, yeah, you could get through it in a minute and a half. Uh, but there, there are a couple of businesses there, but the one that we love is called Sittler's Bakery. And it's a Mennonite run bakery and it, they're all, uh, uh, old order Mennonites who, who live there and who work there in the community. And, uh, they make uh, the most amazing cookies, the amazing, amazing cakes. But the thing that we would always get during the holidays is their coffee cake. Oh, okay. they would, and they would make this coffee cake. It's a very simple cake. It's like a made in a round pan. Uh, not very high, covered in brown sugar and uh, like a butter and brown sugar mixture. Yum. And we would eat it for breakfast. So great. Every, every year. So we, every morning we'd eat it for breakfast with uh, butter and strawberry jam that my mother, or my grandmother would make and, uh, and bacon. 
Uh, so because you have to have the salty with the sweet. That's of a, course, a, of course, kind of a big thing. Uh, and it was it's the best. And and this year I was like for Christmas, it, um, our Christmas plans are kind of all over the place. But I'm right. definitely going to go to Sittler's Bakery. And I'm going to get two coffee cakes. You can put them in the freezer, and then take them out in the morning. They'll defrost within like a half hour, an hour. It's it's heaven, Marco. It's it's heaven with strawberry jam. It's heaven. What about the Christmas stolen? Would they have stolens there? They would have stolen. They would have uh, the Pfeffernoose cookies. Pfeffernoose, yeah. I just bought those are some my favorite. Oh, they're little little mounds of uh, oh, kind of a gingerbready cookie, yeah. but they've been glazed uh, white, so they look like little white kind of uh, sugar hills or whatever. But they've got a peppery feel to them, right? They've got a bit of yeah. a bite to them, which is what I love about them. Yeah, spice. It's really yes. nice. I love it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they and then they would have like tra- more traditional uh, Christmas cookies. The thing that my wife loved there was called a poor John. Oh, and they're basically like a bun or like a sweet dinner roll that's just been stuffed with whipping cream, basically icing, Marco. Basically Yum. white sugary icing it's like if you took like all of the icing from one wedding cake and you just shoved it into a dinner bun okay <laughs> that's what my wife likes to eat different tastes i guess trevor different she's tastes. she has a, a to say she has a sweet tooth uh you know is not enough she has a, the, whole, the whole mouth is sweet super sweet too <laughs> okay yeah. trevor as we're approaching towards the end of this episode that has just flown by for me are there me mennonite or German traditions for the holidays that you grew up with or that you're bringing forward um, to your to your daily sort of life in December? You know, one of the things that we've started doing uh, is uh, putting a, a pickle ornament in our tree. So it's a German tradition, I think a pretty popular one too, where uh, I think what they actually used to do is hang a pickle inside the tree because the pickle is green. It's hard to see. And they would put it up there at a certain time. And and then the kids would come and they would try to find the pickle in the tree. And whoever found the pickle got an extra present or or some kind of treat or something. Right. Uh, So we, we're not really doing that for, for the present. It's not like a competition or anything, but we put it in there just so that, you know, when people come over, they can, they might say, oh, there's a pickle. There's the pickle. My Christmas know, pickle we'll... broke last year. Oh, no. I brought it to my mom's house to put on her tree so that my niece and nephew could find the pickle. And what we do is the first person who finds the pickle gets to open their present first is sort of what yeah. we've incorporated as. Yeah. And Amanda said to me, she goes, if you bring that pickle, there's a good chance it's not coming home with us. It's going to break. And I said, it's not going to break. It's going to be on the tree, whoever finds it. Trevor, the whole night, it was fine. They found the pickle. We opened the presents. It was great. And at some point, my niece was running with the pickle in the house. I don't know why. And she tripped. And sure oh, enough, me. the pickle smashed. And Amanda just looked at me. And I'm like, how did it make it this far? And it smashed only towards the end. And sure enough, so I need a new pickle for my tree. Noted, Marco, and mm-hmm. never run with a pickle if if you learn nothing else from this podcast. It's it's certainly true. Well, Trevor, listen, we're pretty much to the end. Is there a holiday drink that you like to have? So, uh, I mean, I, I I would be remiss not to say eggnog because right. that is something, especially uh, again, my wife having a very sweet tooth uh, loves eggnog. Uh, another would be, uh, simple Bailey's on, on the rocks. That's yes. something. Uh, and to add a little more Christmas cheer, we would throw like a little bit of creme de menthe in there. So it was yes. like, yeah, I called it a creamy leprechaun. It was like just a little bit of Bailey's, a little bit of mint. It, it, it was perfect. Um, but the drink, and I mean, this wasn't just a Christmas drink. This was like the drink. All year round in my house was uh, a Ryan Coke. Yes. Uh, yeah. A Ryan Coke was meant uh, holidays at our house. Um, and then something called a hammer handle, which. Oh, <laughs> I don't know this. A hammer handle is pretty simple. It's a bottle of beer and a shot of whiskey. And you, the idea is that you 
take a sip of the whiskey, you take a sip of the beer. And at our house, when we drink like whiskey or something, we sip it. We don't like, we never just down a shot. I see. You okay. sip it and then you have a chaser with the beer. And uh, my grandfather loved a beer in Canada. It's called Old Vienna uh, or OV. And right. um, they they still make it. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's an okay beer. It's a very working man's beer. Right. Uh, but it, to me, it's like, I'm very nostalgic for it. We had it at my wedding at our wedding, uh, it was specifically for him. Uh, and, uh, and so he would drink a bottle of that and a, a shot, a crown Royal, and then just kind of, we'd play cards. We'd play Euchre or we'd play, you know, whatever card game we decided to play that year. What wonderful yeah. memories. Thank you for sharing them with us, Trevor. Before we go, I always ask our guests on the holiday episodes, what's your favorite carol? Uh, I would have to say Let It Snow. I Let love it. Let It Snow. Well, yeah. it stands to reason someone who plays in the snow in the country would love a carol about it snowing. <laughs> it also reminds me of the movie Die Hard, which uh, I, I love as a Christmas movie. And it is a Christmas movie for those of you who, who celebrate well, there's a controversy of whether or not it's a Christmas movie, and I agree with you, Trevor. It is the action Christmas movie I one agree. should enjoy. All right. Well, thank you, Trevor, for being a part of the episode today. Amazing to be with you, Marco, as always. And for everyone else, whether you take a buggy or a car or a toboggan, we hope that you drive and ride safely during this holiday season. Until tomorrow, we hope you were able to listen and enjoy. <laughs>